So, uh, good afternoon. I'll be talking about um, the title of the presentation is uh, Consuming the Seas. Uh, for those of you who've, um, who've ever dived or have ever um, snorkeled or ever swam in the sea in Cyprus, this is a typical landscape you, you'd see. And I know that you're all focusing right now on, on the fish. It's, it's a grouper. And uh, it's, it's very important to focus on the fish. They even thought it was so important that they put some here for you. So uh, what I wanted to say is the fish is not that important. What is really important is what's, what's behind. And um, the biodiversity in Cyprus is high. You have to get really close and you look at everything. Not everything's going to be big. It's going to be small. And you have to go in close to have a look about it, to look at it. So we're not the Red Sea. We're not, we're not, uh, we don't have any coral reefs. But you can, uh, you can see here vivid colors. And this fireworm is just as toxic as the fish and everything else which, is, uh, which can be found in tropical places, the Caribbean, the Red Sea, where lots of people go to dive, for example. But if you try the experience, it's just as good here. You have to look in close. And this is a particular good story I want to share with you. This day was one of my fine friends who's, who's here had a really good idea. He's, he's a bit of a coral freak, so he said, why don't we go out and look at the corals spawning? Now, if you know anything about this, you'll know that all this is controlled by lunar, lunar states and where, the, sun, uh, where the, the, the moon is, what phase the moon is, so where the levels of the sea is. So I said to him, okay, let's go and see what's going on. So we went, obviously we picked the wrong day or the corals were not spawning, but we did find other things. So here you have all these white shells, gastropods, and they've collected either to feed or to mate. I don't know which, so I wouldn't share you. Uh, I wouldn't tell you. Um, but what happened is we took this picture and then we went back to the office. And we put it on the computer and we blew it up. And then, then we saw this small opistum rank. It's a small shellless slug, more or less. And it's either feeding on the reproduction of the shells or on the shells themselves, whatever's growing on. So if you look really close, even for us, we're trained supposedly to do this. You can, you can, have, a, you can, you can have a surprise. Now, um, the, the characteristics of the Mediterranean and the Eastern Mediterranean is this high, high biodiversity, low abundance. This means that there's a lot of different species, but very few individuals of each species. There's high salinity in the water. It's a lot more salty in the water here than, for example, in Spain. And it's a subtropical climate. The, the, the ecosystem is a prim pr pr primarily done by, uh, has sandy, muddy, rocky substrates. And the coastal areas here in Cyprus are dominated by what we call seagrasses. This species, Posidonia oceanica, this is what it looks like. It's like a tropical rainforest, high biodiversity. It, um, it encompasses all kinds of functions, whether that's uh, reproduction, feeding, habitats. It, it, it's really a really good place for small animals of many different types to live, to reproduce, and to find shelter. And this is some of the work we do. We do a lot of, of diving, obviously, to get there, and we spend a lot of time. And as you can see from, from, from this picture, we have to get in close. And this is really close. You have to look at the roots of all the seagrasses and then lots of other things as well. So uh, moving on, I want to talk about uh, the impacts or the problems caused by, by people, more or less, to the, to the marine environment. As you know, we, we, we sust we're sustained by tourism, and the coastline is highly utilized in Cyprus. There is a lot going on the coastline, whether it's hotels or beaches like this. Obviously, this has, has an impact in, in, in itself. I'm going to share with you a few other examples of, of, uh, of, of impacts. This was a troll survey we had last summer, in the summer of 2011. It, this is garbage we pulled up from 700 meters. It's probably related to shipping. And as you can see from the, from the colored tin of paint or whatever it is, it hasn't rusted yet, which means that it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty um, uh, in a pretty short time. So there's other things out here. There's plastic, there's fishing lines, there's bottles. Anything you can imagine ends up on the, on, on, on the sea floor. Habitat loss. Habitats are lost because of human activities. This is a desalination plant in Cyprus in, 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 in around about 2000, 2001. This is on a bad day. This is when things are not working properly in the, uh, in the desalination plant. And the brine, which is the salt removed from the seawater, uh, so you can have uh, potable water, and some chemicals are put out to sea. This is actually a day when people in, in, the, in, the, in the desalination plant are backwashing their filters. So they're cleaning their filters, and everything goes back to the sea. But it only takes one 
such event every few weeks, every few months, or every few years, to, to lose the habitat of 100 or 200 meters near desalination plants. Of course, the pipe itself is giving substrate. It's giving a different type of habitat. But if you balance, if you balance things, I think more damage is caused than actually uh, takes part. Now, this is a particular favorite of mine. Um, Dredging activity means you make things deeper. So you take a port, a harbor, or um, um, any facility where you put ships, or whether it's called to build a marina, you dig the seafloor. So this big ship here is digging up the seabed, taking up the sediment, making a hole, so big ships can actually enter in a place where it's shallow. And then this is the reports in the media. The media actually picked up on this. The media in Cyprus are not very good at picking up things that happen in the sea. So this was a particular good example. Fish have disappeared in the mud, or the ship that scraped the sea. And it's not only in one place. They pick the sediment up from one place, and they go somewhere else, and they dump it. So they're destroying two places. But we need expensive marinas, and we need um, ports and harbors too. The loss of biodiversity. This here is a sponge. What you see here is a sponge. Half of the sponge, the back half, is black. That's the healthy sponge. The front is unhealthy. It's some, some form of disease has affected it. And this is naturally occurring. I mean, everything has a disease. But we've, we've just been noticing that in places where there's hotter water, where water is warmer, we have particular, um, particular diseases being more prevalent. So this is near a, um, an electric power plant, which uses seawater to cool its, its systems and then pump it back at sea. A few degrees don't make a big difference to most things. But to the sponges, it appears that they do. Eutrophication. This is a problem caused by nutrients. There's an overgrowth of algae, of this white, uh, cl white cloud, as it's called, because of runoff, because of nutrient inputs, because of agriculture, because of aquaculture. So all these nutrients in the environment, in the marine environment of Cyprus, where nutrients are more or less low, it's, it, it's a problem. And what it does is causes these algal blooms. So more or less, these algae cover everything, and then they die and they float to the surface, and they get washed up on a nice touristy beach. And then it becomes a problem. When the tourists are affected, it's a problem. When all the marine life is affected, no one really cares. So this is another thing of, of, of the last few years, since 2005. This is a fish called the Lagocephalus. It's got various names in Greek, but it's come through the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal is a man-made structure. So it's allowed things to move from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Some of them are okay, some of the fish you eat, and some of them are invasive like this. This is destroying the fish ecosystem in Cyprus, this fish. It's a big problem, and it's, uh, it's one, of the, one of the new invasive species. There's many others as well. Now, I want to move on and talk a little bit about fishing now and, uh, and the fishing activity. What you see on this, um, on this um, slide is a radius plotted for every single fishing shelter or harbor in Cyprus in gray. So all the gray area is area which is fished. And as you can see, there's not a lot of area left. Actually, this area exists here, which is between Pisuri and Bafos. The new harbor in Cyprus is going to be built here. Plus, the trawling ground is here. This is where the big trawlers, the big fishing vessels, do a lot of their fishing. So as you can see, every part of the continental slope, because Cyprus is such a, such a steep island, is used. We don't have a big fishing plane, but it's overexploited. Now, overfishing. This is what happens. This is a trawling net. It's not your commercial small vessel. It's a, quite, a big, quite a big vessel. We've only happily got two of these left in Cyprus. So this is what happens when a, fi uh, a trawler scrapes the seafloor, collects fish. Now, why is this important to you? Because when you go to your fresh, to your fishmonger or to your, uh, to your um, fish market, you ask for fresh local fish. This is what you are getting. Now, for the next slides, I want to ask a question. This is sushi. How many people, raise your hands, like sushi? That's 80%, okay? I'm going to spoil that 80%. If no. half the people in this room that raise their hands leave and eat sushi, which is not sustainable, this is why. This is the tuna. This is a bluefin tuna. This is the most expensive tuna in the world. It's the best sushi in the world, too. So, where there's one tuna, there's many tunas, big and small. And where there's many tunas, there's really a lot of tunas. Please note this guy. 
He's actually holding a gun. And this is what happens. This is where your sushi comes from, for bluefin tuna. Maybe not your sushi exactly, because this is too expensive for people in Europe and the US to eat. This goes to the eastern market. So then the heads come off, the tails come off, and the fillets become fillets, and they get frozen on big expensive ships. You know why? Because of this. This is what one 250 kilo fish costs. And that is the first sale, not what you play in the sushi restaurant. So the problem is, okay, we're fishing too many fish, but there's an additional problem. If this works, this is it. What's happening here is that big 250 kilo fish are being caught by 50 and si with 50 and 60 kilo, kilo fish. And that leads to overfishing. That removes fish which have not even reproduced. Right, this guy here, he looks friendly. He's a nice guy. He's a grouper, like the one in the first picture. Anyone who's ever had anything to do with fishing in Cyprus, this is a highly prized species. This is illegal spearfishing. Whether it's with scuba tanks is illegal, and in my mind, although it is not for the government because there are licenses, spearfishing without scuba gear is actually illegal. Now, the problem with spearfishing, I have with spearfishing, is that everybody has to learn to spearfish. So, a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old, an 18-year-old will learn to spearfish. Where will he learn to spearfish? In the coastal areas, four, five, six meters of depth. And it's exactly the same story as the tuna. You're catching the small fish. And then you're not letting them get to a, a certain age where they can reproduce. Now, solutions. This is just an idea, not only by me and I'm going to read it. The only possible solution for a long-term sustainable marine ecosystem is the creation of marine protected areas where human activities are limited and strongly controlled. These are areas closed to fishing, to some fishing activity, not all, but preserves where um, uh, animals and where fish, when other species can survive, can reproduce, can live without being, without being harassed, more or less, by, by, uh, by humans. It's not just my idea. This is Sylvia Earle. Sylvia Earle is someone like Jacques Cousteau. She's that status. She's a Ted Prize winner for 2009. And she says, I wish you would use all means at your disposal, films, expeditions, the web more, to ignite public support for a global network of marine protected areas, hope spots large enough to save and restore the ocean, the blue heart of the planet. So this is everywhere. It's the same problem everywhere. Overfishing, in particular overfishing, is not going to stop. People, like yourselves, will go into supermarkets and fishmongers and demand fish. What has to happen, though, is these protected areas so we can survive. And in Cyprus, we have this network of, of areas from the Natura 2000 side. It's only proposed. There's one here in the, in the Camas, one here in Cape Greco, and one here near Bisuri. And these are proposed. They're not yet enforced. So something is happening. But MPAs could protect vulnerable ecosystems and biodiversity, they could provide interference-free sanctuaries for species to reproduce and juveniles to grow. They could aim to assist the recovery of fish stocks and depleted marine organisms. Now, you might well ask, what has all this got to do with me? It's a, like the previous speaker said, it's the government. The government is going to do this. But there are things you can do. For example, you can teach your children that island life is sustained only if we protect the sea around us. The, to avoid destructive hobbies such as fishing and spearfishing, we can do other things. We don't need to go and kill fish for a hobby. You can go and dive for a hobby. You can go and take pictures for a hobby. You can do anything with the sea, but you don't have to go and kill fish. You can buy the fish at your supermarket, but you are, those fish are for consumption and you're not going to remove more species from, from the environment. And also, select your, the fish you eat from sustainable stocks with appropriate labeling and standards. This is going to come. Sooner or later, for those of us who have lived abroad, this is going to come to Cyprus, and it's going to be a big deal, because we do not have any sustainable fish stocks in Cyprus. Aquaculture is another story altogether. Thank you.